Uh, hi, welcome back. Uh, I see you've all brought me your phones, which I appreciate. I have nine cell phones on here, uh, which is fine. As I said, recording is welcome. Uh, maybe over the course of the semester, y'all can get to know each other better, and we can get this down to like two or three that you just share among yourselves. Uh, but for now, I'll just stay over here. Um, One Android user, it's fine. Uh, okay, uh, so, uh, ancient Israel was geographically tiny and unimportant. That's today's lesson. Uh, here is my map again. Uh, you can see uh, even modern day Israel, but also ancient Israel, belongs in that area that's roughly where it says Canaan. Uh, it doesn't go further to the right than where it says Jerusalem. It doesn't go further to the north than where it says Hatzor, really. Uh, and it doesn't go further south than the Dead Sea, which is just below Jerusalem. So it's that tiny little, it's like the NLEV along the Mediterranean coast there. That's Israel, okay? Um, uh, even, and this is true, even if we assumed like the very largest extent of the kingdom as described in the Bible, um, it would still be tiny. Israel is about the size of New Jersey, right? Uh, which is a useful reference to have. It's also the same, si same shape, essentially, as New Jersey. Um, uh, and the only, the only reason anyone in the ancient world ever gave a damn about Israel for any reason whatsoever is because it was in between the two major powers uh, to the north and the south of it. Also like New Jersey. Um, <laughs> right, it's, uh, right, if, uh, you may have at some point in your education been taught about the Fertile Crescent, uh, which you can see on this map, right? Uh, if you start at Babylonia down there in the bottom right and you go in an arc up the word Mesopotamia, which follows the two rivers, and then down through where all of the settlements are, where it says Levant, you get yourself to Egypt. You want to go that way rather than straight across, because straight across is nothing but desert. And so between Egypt and Mesopotamia, Babylonia, Assyria, stood Israel. And so people were passing through it constantly and needed to make sure that they controlled it in the same way that uh, uh, the US thinks it needs to control everything. Uh, and uh, so this is why anyone cared, anyone in the ancient world cared about Israel. If Israel were a couple of, you know, miles to the east, it would be Ammon, which no one has ever heard of, right? So it's entirely to do with its geography. The only reason that anyone ever cared about Israel uh, in the ancient world. Besides its geographical placement, uh, ancient Israel was politically and militarily tiny and unimportant. Right? Maybe it could occasionally, at its highest points, win a few victories against the little places like Ammon and Moab and Edom down there, right? and certainly uh, the northern and the southern uh, kingdoms of Israel, which we'll learn about later, uh, fought against each other. Maybe they could occasionally win something against the Arameans to the north, but for the very most part, Israel spent the entirety of its existence completely dominated by the major foreign powers uh, of the ancient world. In order, Egypt and Assyria and Babylonia and Persia and Greece and then Rome. And then everyone else uh, until 1948. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, absolutely no military dominance or power or threat to anyone in the region, uh, Israel was, uh, was, was not doing anything on that front. And ancient Israel, and this is the harder of the, the, the ones to, to get your head around, ancient Israel was effectively a cultural backwater. I insert New Jersey joke here. Um, uh, so, you know, what was going on in the, in the ancient world, you know, in Egypt, they were building pyramids uh, in the middle of the third millennium uh, BCE, right? This is uh, on the, uh, this is the uh, ziggurat of Saqqara uh, from 2600, 2500 BCE, 
right, which is pretty cool and awesome. You can see that the modern reconstruction there in the front, but the ancient ruins in the back, that's pretty big. Uh, you may have seen these before, right? Uh, these are at Giza, obviously. This is all going on in the third millennium BCE. In Mesopotamia, we had these awesome ziggurats, uh, like this one um, in Ur from 2000 BCE. And one of my favorite pictures, this is a, this is a ziggurat called Kurigalzu that, uh, you know, again, you can see the modern reconstruction of the base. Uh, the top was once a nice step pyramid and the wind has swept away uh, and eroded it so that it looks like this very cool thing. Um, this is, uh, you know, 1400 BCE when these things are built, and when all of this amazing, uh, you know, cultural achievement was happening around in Egypt and in, in Babylonia, uh, what did Israel look like? Uh, it kind of looked like this. Like, and we can be impressed, you can see the, the, the lines on the hills, we can be impressed that they discovered how to build terraces to stop the rainwater from running away. But I think you can still see, you can, in this picture, you can see like real cities in the back, but you ignore those, right? That's a house up there in the top left, I'm pretty sure. Um, point is, uh, Israel wasn't doing very much while these other cultures were doing amazing things. Israel was a tiny, nothing place. That's the big lesson of the first 10 minutes of this class. Um, now, it is interesting because, of course, for the last two millennia or so, uh, in the West, the Bible, right, the literature of ancient Israel, was considered the source of like all culture. Right? The Bible is where we got ideas about law and ethics and philosophy. It's obviously where religion comes from. Right? Uh, this is the uh, that we can associate this with the notion that we, we call biblical exceptionalism. Right? The Bible is this like amazing, sprung out of nowhere, new thing on the world that like you know, is unlike anything that ever came before it and changed the face of the planet. And so it was largely held until uh, people were like, what if we dug some stuff up and uh, archaeology entered the picture? And archaeology gave us not just obviously things like the pyramids, uh, which we didn't need to dig up anyway, but literature, non-biblical, non-Israelite literature, very old, that looked strikingly like stuff in the Bible. So from Egypt, uh, we found texts like uh, the wisdom of, and you're gonna all learn how to pronounce this, probably not, Amenemope. You're all gonna say anemone and it'll be fine. Um, the wisdom of Amenemope from the 13th century BCE, uh, which looked awfully like some of Proverbs, right? Here you've got the two texts in front of you. Uh, in fact, virtually the entirety of Proverbs 22 through 24 is verbatim from this 13th century Egyptian wisdom text. From Ugarit, remember that little town I keep pointing to up in the corner of the Mediterranean, uh, we found ritual texts uh, like this one that uh, talks about the king cleaning himself and offering rams and birds and oil and bulls and sheep as a burnt offering, as a peace offering, right? Grain and oil, right? Birds, wine, half a, this couldn't look more like ritual prescriptions in Leviticus and Numbers. And it, Ugarit, we also don't have anyone ever sacrificing, I don't know, say, pigs. Right? So, similarities there. Uh, from the Hittites, right, from Turkey, uh, we found, you know, laws that looked an awful lot like biblical laws. Again, this Hittite law from the 7th cen 17th century BCE, basically identical to the law in Exodus. And from Mesopotamia, of course, a, a whole slew of laws, but also, um, you know, Gilgamesh, right, famously with its flood story, or Atrahasis, from the 18th century BCE with its flood story. From the 23rd century BCE, the birth legend of Sargon may remind you of someone else's birth story. If you haven't gotten there yet, it's Moses. I don't want to assume anything. So, you know, again, from the 23rd century uh, in, uh, in Mesopotamia through 
Turkey and Egypt and uh, other areas, even in, in the area of Canaan, uh, production of you know, all of these texts that look like stuff from the Bible. Meanwhile, uh, in Israel, our earliest text not from the Bible looks like this. And it's a little calendar that was found in a field reminding someone when they're supposed to be planting stuff. Right? Obviously, this is a bit of an exaggeration, not, the, not the, what I just said, but you know, the notion that this was like the height of Israelite uh, uh, writing at the time or, or literature. But uh, it's pretty cool. That is, that is what uh, Hebrew script looked like before it looked like what Hebrew script looked like now. Uh, so if you watch you know, like the Ten Commandments, which is a movie I will refer to occasionally and assume that none of you have seen, but I can't refer to Prince of Egypt because they didn't have this in it. I don't, is, what's the newest one? Exodus, Gods and Kings? What do people watch for their Exodus movie in this generation? <laughs> right? I, when I first started, I was like, I could, the Ten Commandments I could get away with, but uh, now I got nothing. Uh, in any case, when he holds up the, the, the Ten Commandments in the Ten Commandments, they, they use this script. Um, it's not right, but it's in the right script. Okay. Um, the discovery of the Mesopotamian material in particular, which occurred in the um, you know, 19th, 20th century, middle of the 19th century on, uh, led to uh, a controversy in scholarship uh, that was called the Bible Babel controversy, right? Babel being Babylon and Bible being Bible. Um, this really wide ranging uh, scholarly controversy, which basically was like, all right, which one was the superior culture? Right? On one side, uh, you had the people who said it was the Bible. The Bible is theologically and ethically correct and represents a more advanced cultural and ethical state. Right? Again, everyone acknowledging that the Mesopotamian material was older, right? that was hard to get around. But you know, was the Mesopotamian material, according to one side, the Mesopotamian material was like, that was the old stuff, right? the old bad, you know, like, early stuff, and the Bible was like the new thing that advanced everything. That's the Bible side. The Babel side was like, the Bible's a cheap knockoff, right? Uh, it's completely dependent on its ancient Near Eastern uh, context for everything in it. Uh, it has no value particularly. It's totally derivative. Um, I, I will say the Babel side, uh, this was a dispute that arose primarily in Germany in the 19th century. You can imagine perhaps that the Babel side may have had some tie with anti-Semitism. It certainly did, um, which doesn't make it wrong just makes it wrongly used. Uh, I'm not saying it's right either. But these were the two sides, right? These are the two sides of the, of, the, of the debate that we had once the discovery of Mesopotamian material made clear that the Bible wasn't the earliest uh, uh, thing and, uh, nor the, the, the biggest thing out there. Uh, what were we going to do with that? Uh, and essentially, these two sides, Bible and Babel, provide uh, the opposite poles of what uh, we call the, the comparative question. Uh, we can take as a case study uh, Genesis 1, which maybe is the most famous passage in the Hebrew Bible. I would imagine more people could say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth than could recite almost any other verse um, in, the, in the Hebrew Bible. Certainly uh, a text that is, uh, is that, what, love your neighbor as yourself? Maybe. Okay. Um, uh, a central text, Genesis 1, of course, to uh, theological positions in both Judaism and Christianity. Incredibly important uh, central text, a, def a definitional uh, text. And so you can imagine how shocked people were in 1849 with the discovery of the Mesopotamian Enuma Elish. Right. And so let's talk about some of the similar features we find between these two, uh, these two pieces of material. So... We have the notion that the earth begins with watery chaos, right? In Genesis, it's, you know, the earth is unformed and void, and there's the surface of the deep, and it's dark, and there's God sweeping over the waters. And so, too, in Enuma Elish, primeval Apsu, uh, that is the, the seas, and Tiamat, that is the depths, uh, are the... The, you know, the opening of the, of the universe, right? That's the ones who bore them all, right? This whole, you know, no cane break was, I don't know what a cane break is, but no cane break was intertwined nor thicket matted clothes. That looks kind of like unformed and void and let's sort of getting at the same idea. Uh, 
if you uh, didn't know, I'm not assuming that you did, uh, this matrix Tiamat, this uh, Mesopotamian deity of the watery depths, uh, is the same word as our Hebrew word for deeps, right? In Hebrew, it's tahom, and uh, in the Enuma Elish, the, again, the goddess is named Tiamat. Uh, so, you know, there seemed to be an, an obvious connection, this Mesopotamian deity of the watery depths and the Hebrew literally word for watery depths. Uh, uh, later, by the way, uh, in the Enuma Elish, Tiamat, the depths will be destroyed. Uh, that same myth seems to be picked up uh, later in the Bible in Isaiah uh, that describes God, Israel's God, as drying up the sea, destroying the, the waters of the great deep. Uh, so, right, Enuma Elish has the Lord trampled upon the frame of Tiamat, and Isaiah has the Lord drying up the great deep. So, we have the watery uh, depths and the chaos at the beginning. Uh, we have creation by word, right? This is one of these things that, like, theologians are super excited about, right? Like, probably all encountered that somewhere, right? God creates just by speaking, just like the word of God makes things happen. Well, the, you know, again, the Bible wasn't there first. In Enuma Elish, creation is also done by the word. Uh, how is heaven made? Uh, well, in Genesis, uh, you know, it's uh, made by separating uh, the waters above and below. In Enuma Elish, it's made by separating the waters above and below. It's just that in Enuma Elish, the waters were a deity, right, that has been killed and split into but it's the same principle. The creation of the heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, the stars, that's in both. You could take that verse from Enuma Elish and slip it into Genesis 1, and most people wouldn't know it was there. And not only are they created, they're created for the same purpose, right, for calendrical functions. And of course, both stories include the creation of humanity. In Numa Elish, let man or humanity be its name. God said, let us make man. And in both stories, humanity is essentially a double of the deities. I will double the ways of the gods and let us make man in our image after our likeness, famously. There's more, those are big ones. It's pretty hard to deny a relationship between the two texts. The question is how to define that relationship. Uh, this isn't the case where it's like, oh, well, you know, it's uh, two similar but uh, slightly different reports of like, I don't know, like a battle during a war, right? These aren't eyewitness reports where two, two, two people were like, I saw it like this, and it was like, I saw it like that. That's not how this works. Um, whatever relationship this is, uh, it's not that they're based in the same historical reality, right? Uh, they m it must be some sort of cultural or literary uh, relationship. So what are some ways we can imagine that happening? Israel and Mesopotamia, perhaps, have a common cultural heritage, right? An ancestor of some sort that is responsible for both. Possible. The author of Genesis 1 uh, has some knowledge and experience of Mesopotamian culture and ideas and sort of adopts them. That's possible. Maybe the author of Genesis 1 knows the text of the Enuma Elish and is copying it. Also possible. Uh, similarities give us all of these possibilities. Maybe it's helpful to look at some of the differences between these two texts. Obviously, uh, Enuma Elish has a, uh, uh, not obviously, Enuma Elish has a temple built, right? That's like the climax of the thing, is the, the building of the temple to Marduk in Babylon. Uh, there's no temple in, uh, in Genesis 1. Uh, Genesis 1 has the creation of plants and animals, but not in the Enuma Elish. Genesis 1 has, of course, the famous seven-day sort of scheme of creation, unique to it. Uh, Enuma Elish has this giant battle, right? The martyr defeats the, uh, defeats the sea and splits it in half, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's no battle scene in Genesis 1. Uh, in Enuma Elish, humanity is created to serve the gods. And in Genesis 1, humanity is created to rule the earth. 
And most obvious, uh, but perhaps also the most important, Enuma Elish is, is patently polytheistic, and Genesis 1, less so. Um, so, again, what are we talking about? The author of Genesis 1 like, knew the actual text of Enuma Elish and was like, no, not that. It was like this, right? It's a polemic against Babylonian theology. That's one perspective. Uh, like, I'm going to take this polytheistic text and I'm going to monotheize it right, in accordance with what I think the deal is. And I'm going to take your gods and I'm going to relegate them to natural phenomenon. Tiamat isn't a deity. It's just water, right? Uh, and I'm going to change the relationship of humanity to the, to the deity. Uh, that would be the sort of like this polemic perspective. I'm gonna, somebody said like, no, that's wrong. Let me tell you the way it really should be. That's a pretty common perspective on what's going on in these, uh, in these two texts. The problem, to my mind, uh, the problem with that view, and actually in a sense a problem with the entire question as we're asking it, is that it approaches each text primarily from the perspective of the other. Right? We're asking what's different, what's the same, and why, and finding the parallels between them becomes like the entirety of the game. At the beginning and the end of the analysis is, look, this is like this, and this is like this. I said a thing. We start asking questions of who is influencing whom, and uh, how is one text reacting to another, right? Because we've sort of put them next to each other and said, fight. Right? Someone's got to win. Uh, and I guess the real question is, is this helping us to understand the text of the Bible, which is what we're here for? Or is it hurting our ability to understand the text? Uh, what we're talking about here uh, is the comparative method. Uh, there basically are three categories of comparison when we talk about comparing biblical and non-biblical texts. There's individual elements within, within the two texts. For example, the creation of the stars, right? That's in here, and that's in here. That's one individual element that I can connect or, or um, you know, link between the two. There's worldview kinds of concepts, like polytheism or monotheism, right? Those are broader themes, or, or not even themes, just ideas within the, you know, in the background of the story. And then there's the text itself, right? The actual words on the page. Maybe to home and Tiamat would be a good example of that, but you know, it's using the same language uh, to, uh, to express its ideas. So, a lot of what you'll, the reason I talk about this is a lot of what you see about the Bible in the world out there is this kind of like uh, comparing it with um, other ancient Near Eastern materials, whether it's the flood stories, right? People love to talk about Gilgamesh and flood stories and talk about, uh, you know, where do they come from? But, you know, all over the place, because we love so much to, like, find historical, like, parallels with the Bible, uh, it's good to know how to deal with them. Uh, so that when you're reading your commentaries, uh, uh, you know, later in life, and somebody says to you, ah, well, yes, Genesis 1 is uh, a pale imitation of the uh, Babylonian creation myth or is dependent on, right, you can at least know how to engage with that. Um, so uh, some principles then of how I think we should be talking about comparing, comparative study. Uh, we should remember that similarities and differences are equally important. Right? It's great to find similarities, but you can't stop there and be like, pfft, samesies. Right? Uh, the differences are just as telling. Similarities don't necessarily mean direct borrowing. Right? Just because two texts look the same doesn't mean that one has to be borrowing directly from the other. Surface similarities, right, things that look the same on the surface of the text, may mask conceptual differences and vice versa. Right? Uh, we have to take into account the genre of the text that we're reading. Right? Two texts can have similarities and look like they might be connected, but be com of completely different types. Just because even if we say one text is borrowing from another, it's not necessarily polemicizing against it. Right? I can borrow from a text and not be trying to say something's wrong with that other text. 
Uh, here's a good one. Uh, we can't judge an entire culture on the basis of a single comparative study. You will often, and even in cases like this, you will often find things to tell you, ah, we can see from the comparison of Genesis 1 and Numa Elish that ancient Israel was, no, you can't. I can tell you that the author of Genesis 1, something, something, something. But you can't take these two texts and say, ah, I can see from this that while ancient Israel believed X, ancient Mesopotamia believed Y. That's not how texts work. Uh, and the primary thing is everything that we're comparing must first be understood within its own context before we then go around about comparing it with anything else. Right? We need to understand what Genesis 1 is and how it works and how it communicates before we can turn to uh, the Mesopotamian parallel for which we should have all also done the same. Right? Otherwise, we end up just being like, look, those two words are the same. I've done a thing. Right? You need to understand. And what that means is knowing enough about the context uh, to understand the text itself. Right? You all picked up a Numa Elish and read it and have effectively, I would assume, no knowledge of the culture that it comes from. Right? So you can read it and you can be like, wow, that looks like Genesis 1, but that does, you don't really understand what's going on in a Numa Elish itself without a you know, serious context. So to that end, let's look not at a Numa Elish. This is not a class in Mesopotamian. Uh, uh, let's look at Genesis 1 on its own terms. Um, so no introduction of God in Genesis 1 is necessary. I'll occasionally put up a blank screen to get you to stop looking up there. <laughs> um, just when I've got like a little time. Uh, no introduction of God is necessary in Genesis 1. It doesn't tell us who God is, right? It's just, here's God. Um, the world at the beginning of Genesis 1 is watery and dark. Right? That's all we know about it. It's watery and dark. And on day one, of course, we get light. Not the sun, right? That comes later, but light. Light is created on day one. Dark is the default eternal state of things. Right? Dark was there to begin with. Light is the, is the new thing. On day two, of course, we get the separation of these, uh, of these waters, right? Remember we had like a, we have like a ball of water uh, and it's got like a light shining on it from some unseen source, like a Dutch painting. Uh, and uh, on day two, that water gets split in half and like a, you know, a dome or something is created inside, like a, you get an air bubble, right? An air bubble inside a globe of water. That's day two. And on day three, we get the land uh, with the vegetation on it. So far, so good. Nice world we're doing. Uh, notice that the first three acts of creation are acts of separation, right? Separation of time, light and dark. Separation vertically, right? The, the waters uh, above and below. And separation horizontally, right? Water from land on the, on the surface. On day four, we get the sun and the moon and the stars, right, which uh, don't provide light so much as exist alongside it. <laughs> um, and that's, uh, th those things are good. Uh, and they're, they're created, we're told, for calendrical purposes. Right? They're there to rule the t t times, right? to determine the months and, the, and the, the special times of the year, none of which are relevant at this point in the story. Right? What's a month? Like, who cares about a month? There's not even people. I need months already. But the, God is, in creation, is looking ahead, right? Is looking ahead, not even to like Genesis 2 or 3 or 4. God is looking ahead to the first time that God ever says, uh, okay, let's talk calendar, which is in Exodus, right? God is looking ahead to when he's talking to Israel, right? Israel's the one that needs months. Um, okay. Uh, so, you know, this picture of this cosmos that's been created, what is it? It's a little hard to picture. What does it look like? Thank you, internet. Here it is. Um, uh, you can ignore uh, some of the funny things like the 
sort of depiction of God at the top, uh, and the heaven of heavens, and the heavens, and the heavens, and the gate of heaven. I don't know what that is. But, uh, but the basic premise here, the basic premise here is the same. You have a circle, you have like uh, a, a globe of water, right? There's water above. You can see the dome that has created what's called the firmament up there, and the moon, and the sun, and the stars are up there in, in the firmament. Uh, and uh, the earth and the waters on the surface have been separated, and there's this whole bunch of the great deep underneath. Ignore foundations of heaven. The windows and doors of heaven we'll get to later. Clouds, super important. Not clear at all why they're there. Um, but in any case, uh, you can understand. And Sheol is uh, the biblical underworld that we also don't need to talk about now. Uh, but that's the basic picture. Right? This is the basic idea. This is how the world is understood in Genesis 1. Not just the world, but I guess kind of everything. Okay? Uh, and this is, this is a helpful picture. Okay, that's what the world looks like. Uh, on day five, uh, we're going to get uh, the fish and the birds. Terrific. And note... It is when fish and birds are created that God first says the words, be fruitful and multiply. Right? The animals get blessed with fruitfulness first, before humans even exist. On day six, we get all the rest of the animals uh, of all kinds, and it's quite good, and we get humanity. And we're told uh, over the course of this, the earth brings forth vegetation, right? And the seas bring forth the fish, and the land brings forth the animals, right? Uh, these are, in the concept of Genesis 1, these are things that replenish themselves, right? Vegetables and animals. God, we're told, brings forth the eternal things. God brings forth light and heaven and sea and land and sun and moon and stars and humans, kind of thing we can, we'll come back to perhaps later in the semester if it comes up, but the, there's an underlying notion there uh, that while animals reproduce on their own, human reproduction maybe requires a little bit of uh, divine, if not intervention, then like, I don't know, help? Um, that, that's, in, that's in there, in the, embedded in the structure of, uh, of Genesis 1. Uh, we have uh, some oddities in this chapter. Uh, God said, let us make humanity in our image after our likeness. Sorry, us? Uh, uh, who is the we? Who is God talking to here? Um, there is, despite what you may read somewhere, there is no royal we in Hebrew. Right? That's not a thing. Um, early interpreters of uh, this text, I mean, you know, early post-biblical, uh, early Jewish and Christian interpreters, had no problem with the we here being equivalent of angels, right? other divine beings uh, who hang out with God. They didn't have any problem with it, and frankly, neither do I. If we have problems with it, whose problem is that really? It's not Genesis's problem, right? That's our problem. Uh, similarly, in our image and likeness, what does that mean? Right? Uh, for our modern, very much non-anthropomorphic uh, notion of God, in our image and likeness is a weird and perhaps problematic phrase. So maybe we'll interpret it as uh, like God in terms of uh, sort of self-conscious, uh, having cre the creative uh, you know, power, um, like God, uh, perhaps uh, imbued with God-like authority over the earth, right? Uh, these are ways that people try and you know, understand what's, what's really being said here. Uh, 
I'm here to tell you that in the Hebrew Bible, I don't think they had any problem with the idea that what was meant here was physical likeness. Right? God, I think they imagined, looked like a human, just bigger, like much, much bigger. Um, Notice a few chapters later, when Adam lives for 130 years, he has a child, a son, in his likeness after his image. Do I think that means that Adam's son was imbued with the same creative power or authority over the, or no, I think it means it looked like him, right? Adam's kid looked like Adam. And I think that the same words mean the same thing uh, and meant the same thing for the biblical authors uh, there. So again, here, I want us to recognize uh, what happens when we run across issues like this. We need to recognize the difference between our interpretive difficulties and something inherently difficult about the text. The text is fine. Right? The text says what it says, and it's hard for us because our understanding of God has changed in the last 2,500 years and doesn't quite fit with what we see here. So that doesn't mean that right, the text is wrong. It does mean that we reinterpret the text to accord with our understanding of God. That's not the same thing as saying, oh, what the text meant or means is my understanding of God. Right? That's a different and more worrisome uh, interpretive move. Uh, you may uh, recall, famously, in Genesis 1, that uh, male and female humans are created simultaneously. Right? Male and female, he created them, it says. Uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, don't get too caught up on it. It's not going to last. Um, uh, humans are then blessed just like the animals, right? Be fruitful and multiply, but with this added element of dominion, right? And uh, rule over the earth. Uh, you know, contrary to uh, what is, I think, has been explicit in the past and is now implicit in some quarters, uh, dominion over the earth does not mean ecological irresponsibility, right? Uh, humanity is the steward of the earth, not its owner, right? Uh, you may hear in your head Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. Right? Uh, uh, humanity is put on earth to steward God's world, uh, not to rule it, uh, and should probably, considering how much uh, the Bible uh, is concerned with uh, kings ruling benevolently, benevolently and justly, uh, perhaps we should consider that uh, humans are meant to rule benevolently, uh, as a just ruler should uh, over the earth. Humans are created in Genesis 1 to be vegetarian. Vegans, even. So all the vegans out there can enjoy that. It also won't last. Um, uh, and for that matter, the animals are created to be vegan, too. Right? So uh, let's not go judging the animals for meat eating. Um, and then we finally get to, that's all day six, by the way. And then we get to day seven. When, of course, God rests and blesses that seventh day and declares it holy. And again, you can imagine the first people being like, cool, you declared that. What does that mean? Like, the seventh day has been declared holy. It, it, the answer is that means nothing again until uh, Exodus, when God says, you know the seventh day that I declared holy? Here's what we're going to do about that. Right? And it's just for Israel and not for anybody else. So again, there's long-range planning going on here, even on the very first day of creation. The whole thing is a careful ordering and categorization uh, of creation, right? Small details, right? Specific distinctions among uh, types of vegetation and fish and animals, right? Everything's created according to its own type. Uh, and there's an overall plan. The six days that match into uh, logical pairs, right? God creates spaces in the first three days and then fills them in the second set of three days. I want to briefly, uh, having gotten to the end of Genesis 1, reconsider some of the comparisons that we were making with the Numa Elish earlier. Uh, monotheism. Genesis 1 is not an argument for monotheism. It's an assumption of monotheism, right? It's like just a, a feature of it. It's, it it's, it's just Israelite, 
right? Like Israel thought that it's God created everything. And so that's what it says. It's not saying not you, me. But what about the Tehom and Tiamat thing, right? Uh, that's not, right, the, you're right, the, the, the depth goddess of uh, Mesopotamia, Tiamat, and the Hebrew word to home for the deeps. Is that a big deal? It doesn't feel like a big deal. That's just like, so they had the same word for a thing. That's not so surprising. That's what I would consider a surface parallel. Pun marginally intended. Um, uh, there's no battles in Genesis 1. Why not? There's no one to battle against, right? We got rid of all the other deities, or not even got rid of them. They just aren't there. But there aren't other deities that God battles with almost anywhere in the biblical text. There are some. We'll get to them later. Um, the creation of the sun, the moon, and the stars, which we saw as one of the parallels between the two texts, right? That's not just like a thing that is sort of like borrowed and, and, and tossed in there. Right? It's deeply embedded in uh, the plan of Genesis 1, as we can see here. It's also deeply embedded in like a much bigger biblical uh, sort of arc of narrative. Right? Same thing is true for the uh, creation of humanity. The seven-day scheme we see here in Genesis 1 is totally unrelated to the Numa Elish and exists entirely for the uh, you know, idea of the Israelite Sabbath. Right? Uh, what part of Genesis 1 is particularly Mesopotamian? Maybe there's a few similar elements here and there, but that's about it. Right? The text speaks to an Israelite audience that has an Israelite worldview and an Israelite theology, right? What Israelite would listen to Genesis 1 and be like, take that, Mesopotamia? Like, it's Israelite. Maybe a better way to think about it, what would the Enuma Elish look like if it were written in and for a monotheistic culture? Right? And what if it were written by like a particularly systematically minded author? And if it were written not as a standalone myth, but to stand at the beginning of a much longer uh, epic work? Basically, it would look like Genesis 1. And vice versa, right? If I were like, what would Genesis 1 look like if it were monotheistic and stood alone and like all those things? It would look like Enuma Elish. Essentially, then, what I'm trying to suggest is that the Enuma Elish and Genesis 1 are each the culturally specific manifestation of a sort of platonic ideal creation myth. Right? And the Enuma Elish is the polytheistic Mesopotamian version, and Genesis 1 is the monotheistic Israelite version. I'm not saying that like someday we're gonna find, right, like the myth they both came from. That's not how myth works, right? But that we can understand, right, a, a sort of a, a common idea of creation that sort of, you know, is distilled into its, uh, its, its various, um, you know, appearances in, in various cultures without having to say one knew the other one. Not to say they didn't know each other. Just what can we, you know, what are the limits of what we can say? Uh, bless you. Okay, so the question then is, uh, as we've now, as, as I've now introduced and destroyed the comparative method, uh, what is the value, not really, what is the value of the comparative method? What is the value of looking at non-biblical texts and asking how they, um, you know, reveal something for us about our biblical texts? What do we gain from doing this, uh, this kind of work? I'll suggest that in many ways what we gain is a loss of innocence, right? We can no longer simply believe that the Bible is unique or original or somehow stands outside of history. The Bible's part of a much larger cultural matrix from which it drew influence and in which it participates. We also gain insight into the biblical text Right, recognizing the cultural context of the Bible, we can perhaps more precisely identify those elements that are simply part of the common ancient Near Eastern heritage, like creation by word. We can identify elements that have been borrowed from that heritage, but perhaps reconceived. And we can recognize elements that are indeed uniquely biblical. The Bible isn't a product of its ancient Near Eastern context. 
it's not determined by its context. We couldn't look just at all the stuff around Israel and say, I know just what that's going to look like now. But it is part of its context, just as much, actually, as texts from Egypt and Mesopotamia are part of that same context. The Bible is of the ancient Near Eastern world. And I venture to say it can't really be fully understood without understanding that world. Okay, I have a few qu minutes for questions, if there are any. Yes, please. Sure. Sure. I love problematizing the idea of monotheism. I'm going to do it all semester long, um, uh, at least in terms of, of the biblical text. And you're probably right that uh, you know it's easier to compare to say polytheism versus monotheism, um, and just put those up as the two sides of the thing. And perhaps we I, we could be more nuanced in thinking about what is actually being described, if not in, in Genesis one, certainly. Much later in the text, we'll see lots of places where I'm going to tell you the Bible is not monotheistic here. Um, and in fact, I'm probably going to tell you, I'm going to tell you later in the semester, that literally none of the things that we're reading this semester are monotheistic. We'll get there. But having said that, I don't think that the existence of other divine beings is actually uh, opposed somehow to the to the term monotheism as, as it's commonly used. We can, you know, we can, we can debate like, can there be monotheism if there, if there are angels? But I think that the vast majority of the history of both Judaism and Christianity that maintain the existence of angels also maintain what we would call monotheism, right? If we're gonna say angels aren't, angels, you know, make monotheism not a thing, then, you know, uh, Lots and lots of uh, of, uh, of Christianity and Judaism suddenly suddenly become not monotheistic, and I'm, I don't think that's quite right. Right? We can still recognize uh, the, the sole existing uh, dominant uh, deity that has even a whole court of angels and seraphs and cupids and whatever the hell's you know, like uh, what are they called? Um, not cupids. What are those things? Cherubs. <laughs> I had the right picture. I didn't, have the, I didn't have the right picture. I'll show you later on in the semester what a cherub really is. It's not a cupid. Um, uh, okay, uh, other questions? Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm not a systematic theologian. I'm, I'm neither systematic nor a theologian. Um, uh, but we should remember that the history of interpretation of the Bible, starting from, uh, at the very least, the early rabbis of the first couple of centuries, um, CE and perhaps earlier, all the way down to the present, much of the history of the Bible has been premised on, the history of interpretation of the Bible has been premised on, I need to figure out a way to make this all make sense, right? Because if I say it all makes sense except this, right? That's not okay, right? It's all Bible or none of it is Bible, right? So this, right, what you're referring to as systematic theology is not really different from every attempt that's ever existed, uh, and I think that's 2,000 years worth of interpretation, to try and find a way to not make the Bible in contradiction with itself, right? I need to find some system by which I can interpret the whole uh, without losing some of the parts. And doing so always results in, first of all, the highlighting of ve the very contradictions that are, uh, that are trying to be solved, right? You don't, if you need to solve things, right, it means there's problems. Uh, 
So it highlights the existence of the problems, uh, but also simply the fact that there are, um, you know, it, it's always going to mean, okay, well, I'm going to take this verse and understand this verse, therefore, that way, and, 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 and clean stuff up. Um, a lot of what we're going to be doing in here is highlighting uh, the places where, in fact, this text and this text don't say the same thing, right? And asking the question of not how do I make them into one coherent thing, but in fact, how do I reckon with a Bible that is not one coherent thing and that, in fact, preserves multiple things at once? That's systematic, too. It just has a, it just has a different kind of framework around it, right? Um, okay, I heard the bell ring. Evidently, now the bells ring to mark class periods, which I did not, is not a thing that ever happened before. Uh, so uh, enjoy your Monday off and your long weekend, and I'll see you Wednesday.